Tayo po'y manalangin. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your loving kindness truly endures forever. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here and for ushering us through another month. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, for the month that has passed because you have revealed your faithfulness in our lives as individuals and our lives as, and, and our lives as members of Bread from Heaven Christian Fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hope, giving us something to look forward to, giving us comfort, even in the midst of the things that we experience from day to day. Heavenly Father, we commit to you this time, and we ask you, Lord, for forgiveness, Lord, if there's anything that we have done, anything in mind, heart, and in spirit that may be displeasing to you. So for today, Lord, we bid you, if it pleases you, speak, Lord, through your unworthy servant. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' most precious name, and all of us will say, Amen. Okay, Pa. Uh, one of the things that we usually have to do when we embark on a new chapter is we have to get our bearings because we have to orient ourselves with what has transpired and set things in perspective so that we will not get lost in the new chapter. So we're taking up uh, 2 Corinthians for this month. But before we begin, I'd like to again uh, go through a summary of uh, Paul's dealings with the Corinthians so that we will be oriented and we will put in context the things that will be said here today. So, let's do a quick summary of Paul's dealings with the Corinthians. First, in AD 50, Paul was the founding missionary of the Corinthian church. So, Paul was called by God to minister to the Gentiles and therefore, in AD 50, the, the, the church of uh, Corinth was founded. And Corinth is, of course, in Greece, a, uh, an ocean's throw away from Jerusalem. So from there, he went to Ephesus four years later where he wrote the very, very first letter to the Corinthians. And he alludes to this first letter in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. And, he, and a year later, he receives bad news from Chloe and sends Timothy to deliver the second letter, which we know as 1 Corinthians. So just a piece of clarification, Paul. When he was in Ephesus, four years after having ministered and after having founded the Corinthian church, he wrote the very first letter to the Corinthians. And he alludes to this in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, which means, ano ibig sabihin nun? Yung 1 Corinthians na alam natin is not really 1 Corinthians at all. There is a first letter that precedes or that antedates 1 Corinthians. And uh, in the letter that he writes, the second letter that he writes, which we know as 1 Corinthians, he was prompted to do so because he received bad news from a friend named Chloe, and he sends Timothy to deliver the response to that, which we know as 1 Corinthians. Okay, also, because of this, Paul paid an emergency visit. Nabahala siya. There's something very, very wrong with the Corinthians. I know this, sabi niya, because Chloe delivered the news to me, so he pays a visit to the Corinthians, and it did not go well. What was in 1 Corinthians, which, which, was, uh, which was actually bothersome to him? He expresses this as what? We took this up. There was disunity in the church. There was sexual immorality in the church. There were people in the leadership who were accusing him of not being a competent or not being a credible apostle. So that is why when he went to Corinth, he confronted his accusers. And during this time when he confronted his accusers, hindi po maganda ang nangyari. So uh, we do not know exactly what took place, but he confronted his accusers. And then after which, afterwards, he left. And he returned to Ephesus where he wrote a letter of sorrow. This letter is the third letter that Paul actually wrote to the Corinthians. And it is mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. So meaning to say, yung 2 Corinthians na alam natin is not the 2 Corinthians at all. So there is another letter which predates 2 Corinthians. And here, he wrote about sorrow, he wrote about anger, and the principal message of this letter, because we do not have it yet, is said to be, how did it come to this? How did the church in Cor, bakit na uwi sa ganito? How did, how did it end up like this for you Corinthians? And after this, 
he goes on to Troas to preach. So he went to Troas, a place in uh, Asia Minor, very, very close to Ephesus. Well, not really very close. It's, it's quite far, but uh, it's within a, an ocean's throw away from, uh, a sea's throw away from Ephesus. Well, and then here, he decides not to return to Corinth. Perhaps in that letter prior, he said to them that I would like to return to you after the confrontation. But he decides not to do a return visit because he wanted things to cool down. He wanted emotions to simmer down a bit and he wanted to let the hurts pass and then uh, perhaps he, after he hears from Titus, he will go back to Corinth. And then after Troas, he leaves for Macedonia and while in Macedonia, Paul hears good news from Titus and he writes the fourth letter, which we know as uh, 2 Corinthians, six years after the founding of the church. So, in summary, ano nangyari? AD 50, Paul, uh, Paul is the founding missionary to the church in Corinth. Second, four years later, he goes to Ephesus as, being, as part of being a missionary. So, he, he ministers to the Ephesian Christians and becomes a, an integral part of the founding of the Ephesian church. But here, he finds out something bad has happened to Corinth. Nung wala siya, nagkaroon ng problema, nagkaroon ng disunity, nagkaroon ng sexual immorality. So he comes back to Ephesus and tells them off. He told them that this is not to be so. He confronts his accusers, nagkasamaan ang loob, bumalik siya sa Ephesus. Hindi pa siya tapos. He wasn't done yet. He wrote a letter, a letter of sorrows. And he did not decide to go to Corinth. And he goes to Troas to preach. And uh, from Troas, he leaves for Macedonia. And it was in Macedonia that he writes the second letter to the Corinthians, which we will be studying again today as part of our series. Now, the text for this morning is on 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, and 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. This was after Paul has spoken to them that the reason why I did not come to you is I wanted to let the sorrow pass. Beginning in verse 12 from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says this. If you have your Bibles, and if you're there yet, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Beginning in verse 12, where he says... When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. He was waiting for good news from Titus, but Titus was not yet there. So, I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia, north, northeast of that. It's a coastal town, Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us it spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Now, moving on to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards him. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, meaning the law. This is the law, po, ano? For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. May the Lord add His blessings upon the reading of His holy word, and all of us will say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, 
Mga kapatid, one of the biggest challenges, and I'm sure my co-preachers will agree with me, that one of the biggest challenges to understanding the letters of Paul is coping with Paul's tendency to shift from one thought to another. So, even after he has stated the purpose of his letter from the beginning, you would notice that in many of his letters, parang, have you heard of the term flight of ideas? Sometimes he shifts from one thought to another. So he starts out by saying that in this particular chapter, we are talking about suffering and the comfort of God. Now, a few verses later, he shifts from one, from one idea and he talks about another. So it is very, very challenging to put into context and to do an accurate and precise interpretation of Paul on the basis of context because he shifts from one idea to another. Let me show you an example. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul has set the tone for the letter, for the entire letter. The entire 2 Corinthians, he has set the tone. And he described God as the God of comfort who comforts us in sufferings, including sufferings experienced while serving him. This is what Paul was trying to say. Now, the problem is this. From, from chapters 2 to 7, Paul digressed. So, nalipat, nalipat ang istorya. Now, Paul digressed from chapters 2 to 7, and he spoke about the challenges that he was experiencing while serving God in ministry. Now, if you were someone who was trying to, to create or craft a message by the grace of God, iisipin mo na lang that these things that he is saying, the experience that, that he was narrating as a minister, as a missionary, were all in the context of suffering and God providing comfort during the suffering as we are ministering to him. Tama po ba? So that, this is what, this is what, uh, this is how we should uh, understand the writings of Paul, specifically 2 Corinthians, which as compared to 1 Corinthians was more pastoral. You will find Paul ranting and raving about this and that. He was ranting and raving about this and that. And then later on, he goes back to his original theme, which is the God of comfort in the midst of suffering. Now, in Troas, now I'd like to show you this picture. This is a picture of the present-day Troas ruins. Uh, Troas was named Alexandria Troas actually because after Paul had engaged the Troas Christians, it was acquired by Alexander and made it very famous. No? So Alexander the Great. So Paul in Troas, uh, so it was named after Alexander the Great. So Paul in Troas was a city where the gospel was well received. So it was a city where the gospel was well received. Kanya sinabi ni Paul, Though the doors were open, hindi siya nag-stay sa Troas and he decided to go to Macedonia. Troas was a city where the gospel was received and he was able to preach here and there were some Christians who were gathered here and they eventually became a church which was not problematic as far as Paul is concerned. Now, when Paul traveled to Macedonia, it was here that he writes the fourth letter to the Corinthians which we know as Second Corinthians because it was here that he was reunited with Titus. Dito dumating si Titus, and Titus had with him news from the Corinthian church, news that took place after he visited them, news that took place after he wrote his letter of sorrow, and Titus had some news for him which was rather good. Although, there were still some issues here, there were fresh accusations against him that he was a fickle-minded man, Kasi parang nga talagang fickle-minded. Kasi palipat-lipat siya ng ideas when you read his writings. So he probably was a fickle-minded man, but we don't know. It is here that he writes the fourth letter to the Corinthians, which we know as 2 Corinthians. So am I might just like to, I'm just going to say this again. The other two letters that Paul wrote are not with us for the simple reason that it is God's sovereign will not to reveal to us the contents of those letters. Yun lang po. God does not want us to see the contents of this, those letters. And besides, all of the things said by Paul, plus all of the prophets and all of the New Testament writers, make up a complete gospel already. So, wala na tayong issue done. So, it is here in Macedonia where Paul writes the second letter to the Corinthians. Now, here in our text today, Paul was addressing fresh accusations coming from his opponents in Corinth about him being a fickle-minded man. Kasi sabi niya nung una, sabi ko nga sa inyo po, sabi niya to the Corinthians, I promised that I will go to you, but I decided not to. So, there were things that were being said about him. Where is Paul? Why is he changing his mind? 
What kind of apostle do we have here? He comes here, he confronts us, he, he, he straightens us, he says he was, he's going to come back, and now he changes his mind, he goes to Troas and then to Macedonia. What, what, what's happening to Paul? What's up with him? So Paul was addressing accusations coming from his opponents about him being a fickle-minded man. But Paul contended that his timeline, his timeline was based on what God's plans were, so regardless of how he felt about going back to Corinth, as a servant of Christ, he follows God's timeline, not man's. So this is where we will take off from today. Paul, as a servant, was following God's timeline and not the timeline of the Corinthians, regardless as to how he felt about going back and fellowshipping with them again. He was following God's timeline. So, also... So he was following God's timeline. So, consistent with what he always said, when we surrendered our lives to Christ, when we became believers, we became slaves. Tama? We became slaves. When we surrendered our Christ to Jesus Christ, what does that make us? That makes us slaves. And what do slaves do? Slaves serve their master. So it's about servanthood. When we surrendered our lives to Christ, we became his slaves, and therefore slaves will serve their Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Which brings us to this morning's main transition statement, which is this. Every believer is called to be a servant of Christ. Do you agree? If you are a believer, if you have been changed by Jesus Christ, if you have been converted by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is academic, it is smooth, that you are called to serve your master. We are called to serve. It goes without saying, part of being a believer is to be a servant of Christ. It therefore behooves us to ask this question, what should all believers know about being a faithful servant? What should we know? What is Paul's take on being a faithful servant, based on the text that we have this morning. What should we find out? First, as God's servants, He will always lead us to situations where He, and not us, will be glorified. Ulitin ko po, ha? As God's servants, one of the things that we should know is this. He will always bring us to a situation where He and he alone will be glorified. Whether that situation is good, whether the situa situation is easy, whether the situation is difficult, he will always bring us to a situation where he will be glorified. Reading to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, where it says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession, and through us, it spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. What does this mean? What does it mean to be led in a triumphal procession? And what does it mean when He's saying here fragrance of this and fragrance of that? We will, we will go to that as we continue our discussion. What did Paul mean by a triumphal procession? This is a triumphal procession. In the context of where Paul was coming from during his day and age, what was common especially during the Greco-Roman times. And what was more popularized during the Roman, the Roman times is the concept of a triumph. You know what a triumph is? This is what a triumph is. When a general in the Roman army defeats, without, uh, uh, defeats an enemy in a faraway land, he becomes a victor. He becomes triumphant. So, natalo niya, ang mga barbarians in Europe, when a Roman general defeats the enemies in Europe, he becomes a victor. Now, what happens to the victor is this. When he comes back to Rome, a procession is organized in his honor. The procession is called a triumph. And in that procession, the Roman general is going to be at the front, leading his troops, leading his people, on the way, on their way to the Forum. If you've been to Rome, it is called the Foro Romano. So, nakikita niya, parang maliliit na mga maliliit na lugar yon. This is where the Roman general leads the procession, and he stays there and is honored by the Caesar. So, 
the general is given a seat at the at the along alongside the, the emperor and he stands there and is given the honor beside the general are his soldiers and his slaves so these are the ones who follow him so along with the general they too are given honor so this is what paul was talking about the very concept of a triumphal procession he was referring to has to do with a Roman triumph or a Roman procession. So what does this mean? The implication of this is that there will always be there will always be a tension between what we want to do for God versus what God wants us to do for Him. There will always be a tension. We have to remember we are being led into triumph but we are not the leaders. We are being led. So our general is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Victor in Rome, in Roman Latin, means Jesus is the victor. So we follow him and he leads us. So this means that there will always be a tension between what we want to do for God and what God wants us to do for him. So anong practical implication ito? What is the practical implication of, of this? It is this. In ministry, it is always good to plan, but the outcome of the plan is always subject to God's will. You remember the book of Proverbs, what it says? The steps of a man, the, 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 the steps of a man are always what? Directed by God. The man may plan, but his steps are always directed by the will of God. So in ministry, in ministry, it is always good to plan. But the outcome of the plan is always subject to the will of God. And ministry for ministry's sake is doomed to fail. So ito po, no? Therefore, ano rin ang implication nito? Success in ministry is measured in our obedience to do His will not by the full implementation of our plans. There are many, many people here from the corporate world, and corporate people are excellent in organizing, excellent in making plans, and excellent in enforcing. That's what you call as corporate discipline. May corporate discipline. There is, a, there is such a thing that when one, one organization makes a plan, it is planned meticulously, it is, it is deliberated very well, and it is enforced. So, a vision, is, a vision is crafted, it is planned out, and it is enforced, and this is what you call as corporate discipline. But this is the problem. The, the, the plans of man belong to him, but God, it is God who directs his steps. So like I said, there will always be attention. So therefore, I'd like to use this example. Uh, hindi ako nakakapagpaalam pa sa aking mga elders, no? but I'd like to use this example. Yesterday, I heard that there has been a meeting. That there has been a meeting that by the grace of God, uh, an owner of a lot nearby has actually expressed interest to sell the lot to us. So, medyo exciting, di po ba? Exciting because we, we are able to see, our mind is able to craft visions of what the future may hold for Bread from Heaven Christian Fellowship. Our vision in our mind's eye may perhaps see a congregation or a sanctuary perhaps two or three times the size of this one. I'm saying just vision lang po, ha? Vision lang. So we may be able to see a congregation where our, our, our sound system is perhaps more extensive than the one that we have now. These are visions. These are, these are things that we want to happen in the future. But there will always be a tension between what God really wants from us and our desire to actually implement these things. So therefore, what does it require from us? What does it require from our leaders? First of all, it requires humility. It requires the humility knowing that our plans will always be subject to the will of God and nothing will ever move forward unless God allows it to happen. Totoo? So, even in our own individual lives, even in our ministries, if we, for instance, decide on a song 
decide on a song for the praise and worship team. There will always be a tension between what we want as artists, what we want as praise and worship team leaders, and what God really wants. And sometimes, the bridge between what we want to happen and what God wants to happen is called a bridge of discernment. So we have to be able to discern. So discernment requires humility. Discernment requires wisdom. And discernment requires submission to what God really wants, not what we want. Amen to ba? Amen. So in, in our lives, success in our lives, because all of life is ministry. You agree? All of life is ministry. You are not only ministers when you are involved in church. You are ministers if you are fathers. You are ministers if you are mothers. If you are, if you are a son or daughter, you are in ministry whether you like it or not. So therefore, what do I do as a parent, what I do as a mother, may not be what God wants for our children. So therefore, our models and our mental images of what our children can become or how our children should be raised might differ from what the Bible says. So therefore, we have to have humility, we have to have discernment, and we have to have the submission to obey God. So success in ministry is measured not in obedience to our will or not how strongly we adhere to what we want to what what it is that we want to happen but success in ministry is measured in our obedience to the will of god and his will alone so therefore as god's servants he leads us into situations where he and he alone will be glorified second as god's servants he makes us attractive to those who are being saved and unattractive to those who are not as God's servants, He makes us attractive to those who are being saved and unattractive to those who are not. So reading to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16a, where it says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are perishing, uh, sorry, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. So, what does this mean? Balik po tayo sa tinatawag nating Roman triumph kanina. The triumph is a procession, right? So the Roman triumph is a procession. You have the general at the head of the pack, flanked by his soldiers and followed by his, his slaves and the lower ranking soldiers. So this is what is happening. Now, in, when you attend, when you attend a triumph or a triumphal procession, Mabango ang environment. It smells very, very nice. And why is this so? Because the priests or the pagan priests who are flanking or following the general are floating around, are floating around this. This is an incense carrier. So he is doing this. So nakakaroon ng smell of incense. Dun sa, dun, sa, ano, dun sa pathway na dinadaanan nila, bango! So these are expensive perfumes. These are burnt. So when the procession is passing you by, you will smell a very, 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 very fragrant and pleasant smell. Also, not only that, what makes it even more mabango is this. The people who are cheering the general on have flowers. And they are throwing and scattering the flowers along the path by which the general would take. So mabango. Napakabango talaga ng, napakabango talaga ng, ng, ng dinadaanan. So mga kapatid, dito siguro natin nahango yung salita that if you are successful or triumphant, mabangong mabango ka. So this is what, this is what it probably means. No? So in other words, if a triumphal a triumph, a triumph procession is, is coming your way, you can expect that the air and the atmosphere would be very, very fragrant. Now, etong issue, the sense of smell is subjective. Tama? The sense of smell is subjective. Meaning, what may be fragrant for you may be unpleasant for me or repulsive to me. My wife always wants me to wear perfume. I do because gusto niya but I have, a, I have a big problem with perfumes. 
I'm allergic to the smell of it. It makes me bronco constrict. Ibig sabihin ng bronco para ako hihikain, no? So it it makes me want to cough because I cannot really. Uh, I, I really have a very th a low threshold for very powerful smells. So whether you are wearing a what? Sorry, brother. Where's your dad? Brother Richard is not here. <laughs> so no, I, I appreciate all the perfumes that, that, that were given to me as gifts. But I have a problem with, with my sense of smell when it, comes to, when it comes to perfume. The sense of smell is subjective. What may be fragrant for one person may be rep repulsive to another. So look at this picture, for instance. That's something which I love to eat. I learned to eat that over the last 10 years. That's something which I love to eat, but for some, that is revolting. I see people here from Singapore. So that is something which I, like, like you, I love to eat that. But for some, it is, it is really repulsive. So you have that picture there where the man who's probably selling it Find, find, would find uh, Doria, the durian fruit very pleasant for him. This is what is happening to us. In the spirit world, this is, this is what is happening. And what do I mean by this? For the regenerate, for the regenerate, the gospel and those tasked with sharing the gospel will be a source of deliverance. But for those who are spiritually dead, they will be an offense. It is offensive to them. What you represent, which is the gospel, and how you carry yourself, kahit na anong gawin mo, pag na-expose ka, sometimes you will, you will find, you will find that in, if perhaps in your family, you have family members, relatives, or in your place of work, or in school, wala ka namang ginagawa. But you were heard talking about Christ. Wala ka namang, wala ka namang inaaway. There are some people may not like you. Perhaps the reason is you and what you represent are offensive to them. I'd like to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you a story about the doc late Dr. Billy Graham. Whether you agree with his theology or not, hindi ko pagdududahan na si Dr. Billy Graham is in the presence of the Lord. So I'd like to tell you about this, uh, the, the late Dr. Billy Graham. <clears throat> Dr. D Billy Graham is an evangelist, right? So, uh, the Lord used him to conduct evangelism, mass evangelism, and uh, in, that particular, in that particular setting, he was known to us. And he was also known to different heads of state. Queen Elizabeth was actually asking for his audience because he, wa he wanted his counsel on many things. Many presidents in the U.S. and elsewhere wanted his counsel and sought his wisdom on many things. One day, Pre uh, President Richard Nixon invited him to a uh, golf tournament. He was just invited. He did not present, uh, hindi siya nagpresenta. He was just invited to a golf tournament. And the uh, golf teams were divided, no? Pinaghati-hati yung mga, yung mga teams. Kasi you know, Team A, Nixon, etc., etc. The other one is uh, Agnew, Vice President Agnew, and the other, the other staff who were with him, the Secretaries of State, etc. Now, they were now having a problem kung saan ilalagay si Dr. Billy Graham. Why? Maraming ayaw nakakampi siya. And they were asked, why do you, why do you resent him being your teammate? One, one uh, White House Chief of Staff was asked. Sabi nung White House Chief of Staff, I just can't bear the thought of him being with me because... He talks about righteousness so much. He talks about sin so much. He talks about God so much. I cannot bear being with him. So in other words, wala namang ginagawa si Dr. Billy Graham sa kanya. But they just don't want to be with him because they feel that what he stands for and who he is is an offense to them. So therefore, to them, he is the stench of death unto death. And perhaps the reason for this is because they are dead in themselves, in their spirits. So this is the reason. So you will find that in your own experience, sometimes you will have relatives, as I said, you will have schoolmates or classmates, na wala ka namang ginagawa. But the thing is, they just don't like you. Is it your face? Is it your girth? Is it, your, is it the way you carry yourself? Or is it because of the message that you proclaim 
and because you and 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 because probably because you stand for it, you stand by it. So you are a stench unto them. But when you, for instance, speak about God to a person who has been made alive in the Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you speak to a person who has already been born again, already been born again, huh? so kapag God dumating sa kanya, and this person sees you, and you are convicted to proclaim the gospel to this person, to this person, you are a source of deliverance. And you are a fragrance unto life. Life unto life for this particular person. For he has been made alive in the Spirit, and therefore, when he listens to you, you and your countenance will serve as a source of hope for him because he will know the reason behind your countenance, which who is Jesus Christ. So, this is a story about Dr. Billy Graham, and you will find that this is true and will be true for you. So, amen po bayan? So, this is what, these, are, these are some of the things that we experience. And finally, last. So, as a review... As God's servants, He makes us attractive to those who are being saved and unattractive to those who are not. We become a stench unto those who are dead in the spirit, but we are a fragrant aroma to those who are made alive already by the Spirit of God. So third, as God's servants, this is very important po, pakinggan natin. He teaches us that whatever success we may have in serving is not due to our efforts, but His. So, as God's servants, He teaches us that whatever success, whatever impact we may create in ministry, it is, it is so because it is not due to our own efforts, but it is because of His equipping. Reading to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, where it says, And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Therefore, in ministry... Kailangan po nating matandaan that what we are as a church, the length of time that we have survived as a church, the length of time that we have a council, the length of time that we have the ministries that, you know, there, there was a ministry fair recently, recently held. The reason why we have all of those ministries, the reason why we are making an impact both in the immediate community and in other provinces, the reason why people come here to hear the gospel is not because of the eloquence of the ones preaching, not because of the, the diligence of the ones who invite people to come here, not because of the, the, the strength of the organizational planning of our leadership, but it is because... It is God who orchestrated these things to come to pass. Not by our own might, but by the sufficiency that comes from being a child of God because He is our all in all. Now, anong, ano kailangan nating matutunan dito? Well, simple lang po ang lesson dito. For every success that we, we experience as a church, success as defined by whatever definition you would like, Attribute it in praise to the God who deserves it, not us. So, for instance, if we, for instance, have a church in, in the future which is really big, it will always serve us well if from time to time we proclaim a thanksgiving unto the Lord that it is, is His will, it is His strength, and it, it, is, it is His enabling that allowed us to have these provisions, to have these facilities, and, to, for, and that we are making an impact in our community. It is never through the, preach, the preachers who come here, but it is through Him who enables the preachers to teach, the officers and the leaders to plan, and for the, bread, the, the brethren like you who make it possible not because of you, but because of Him who equips us. So humility, mga kabated. The overarching theme of point three is 
humility. Let us always be humble. Let us not take... Alam niyo po, one of the more, more dangerous things to, to have, as I've said before, is when someone who is involved in ministry takes ownership of the ministry. And a little kingdom is proclaimed and is owned by him. Nagkakaroon ng little kingdom mentality. And therein comes your sense of entitlement. The much talked about sense of entitlement. So therefore, as I said, humility. Humility because we are not God, we are the slaves and the servants of him who sits on the throne. He is our king. So, let us summarize. Let us summarize before we hold our Lord's Supper. Every believer is called to be a servant of Christ. And what should every believer know about being a faithful servant? Let's read together. As God's servants, number one, he will always lead us to situations where he and he alone will be glorified. Second, he makes us attractive to those who are being saved and unattractive to those who are not. So take comfort. Wag tayong malungkot that some people might not like us, some people might find us repulsive because it is God's will to make us attractive only to those who are being saved and unattractive to those who are not. Wag natin problemahin yung image natin sa lahat ng tao. Third, He teaches us that whatever success we may have in serving is not due to our efforts, but His. It reminds us again and again that we cannot take ownership of the impact that we have made as ministers and as a church because the only reason why that impact is here is because He enabled us to do so. For in Christ, ano nga sabi? We are nothing. So therefore, I'd like to ask the office bearers to come to the fore as we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we celebrate us being servants of our King.